yeah in the earlier lectures we have seen how magnetic materials can be used in uh, uh, different applications. Uh, when whenever we talk about magnetic materials uh, the most important feature that comes to our mind is uh, magnets and uh, the fundamental applications that govern magnets and how the magnetic induction can be used in variety of applications. Uh, <coughs> as we have seen in the uh, previous lectures magnetic materials uh, also play a decisive role in controlling other properties. For example, uh, in the case of manganites we said magnetic property of manganites controls the electrical conductivity and uh, two dual properties go hand in hand which we call it as uh, <coughs> a dual property of magneto resistance where magnetism governs the uh, resistivity of that material. And uh, we have also seen how this effect is pronounced in multi layers and we were talking about uh, tunneling magneto resistance. Also as another example we showed how we can translate a insulating or a semiconducting material by carefully doping some magnetic impurity how you can transform even with the low level of doping say 1 or 2 percent you can still transform that material to be go magnetic. <coughs> Today uh, I am going to uh, isolate another important uh, group of materials called magnetic materials that retains shape. So, no matter what happens to this material because of its uh, intrinsic property uh, of this magnetic material to get deformed from a um, elastic to a super elastic behavior they have a special tendency to retain its memory. So, when a particular stimuli is given it can come back to its original shape. So, this is pronounced in a uh, rather few uh, materials predominantly they are called alloys um, and these alloys are materials uh, sandwiched between uh, few 3D and 4D metals and uh, <coughs> there, uh, there are also non metallic uh, uh, materials called polymers which show the same property that is to retain its shape. So, uh, I will take you through some uh, issues and more so I will also highlight specially one aspect of this magnetic material that is magnetic alloys which uh, is uh, finding lot of applications in um, today's life. <coughs> um, to start with let us uh, go with some of the basic definitions. Uh, shape memory materials they are classified as SMMs. So, shape memory materials are featured by their ability to recover their original shape from a significant and seemingly plastic deformation. You can just pull it and after a particular stimuli it can come back to its same shape. <coughs> and uh, this stimuli can be either uh, <coughs> pressure or it can be uh, temperature or it can be light and so on. <coughs> this is known as shape memory effect which we call it as SME. Um, in alloys it is usually super plasticity that is happening uh, even in some oxides you can actually pull such oxides at a particular temperature and it almost behaves like rubber and it can even go through a plastic deformation. So, they are called super elasticity uh, and this is more pronounced in metals or alloys and uh, in polymers it is called viscoelasticity. It can go beyond its uh, 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 blending temperature and uh, these are observed at certain conditions. The SME can be utilized in many fields for example, in aerospace engineering, uh, in deployable structures and morphing wings mainly to arrest the vibrations in aerodynamics. Uh, these uh, alloys are specially used and uh, if you go to medical devices as an extreme case you even see um, in stents that are deployed in our uh, cardiovascular system 
you can see these are finding enormous application. Um, a recent <coughs> article in materials world which was written by Huang and co-workers they have um, specially covered some of the essential features of this uh, <coughs> of these alloys. I would like to emphasize more with respect to this article and pick out some of the examples which they have listed out. So, I will be essentially dealing with the, uh, this article written by Huang and this is the article that featured in materials world. Mm. So, as I told you um, <coughs> the severely and quasi plastically distorted materials they recover in uh, to their original shape um, at the presence of a right stimulus. So, um, there are two three group of compounds which we, we will be studying in today's lecture one is super plastic or uh, shape memory alloys, um, the next one is shape memory polymers and uh, we will also show some example of uh, shape memory hybrids that has both the polymer and the alloys impregnated in each other. Therefore, we can see how the, the properties can be understood. Uh, as I uh, list uh, told you in the beginning shape memory alloys are thermo responsive. So, at low temperature suppose you try to make a particular shape uh, like a spring or a hook uh, using alloy then at a high temperature you can actually remove that shape uh, at the transition temperature or at, at the uh, temperature where uh, there is a martensitic transformation of this alloy. And once you cool it down again the same shape that you formed for this alloy can be retained. So, this is called the thermo responsive the shape recovery is heat. Some uh, shape memory alloys also show magneto uh, response. In other words uh, applying a field you can try to revert it back to the same shape. <coughs> shape memory alloys can be categorized into many uh, compounds uh, just single out some, some of the widely used ones in today's application. Nickel titanium alloy is one of the predominantly used one and uh, this was a path breaking discovery uh, by US uh, defense lab uh, in the early uh, uh, late part of uh, the last century and it is also nicknamed as netinol <coughs> nickel titanium alloy uh, and uh, uh, the essential feature is it has very high performance in terms of uh, elasticity mechanical strength and also it has a very good biocompatibility uh, closely followed by copper based alloys and uh, for example, uh, copper based alloys are Cu Al Ni and Cu Zn Al these are very good compounds which, which are cost effective because unlike nickel and titanium copper based uh, alloys are much more uh, <coughs> cheaper and uh, processing is easier because they are more malleable. So, you can uh, the workability into different shapes is achieved much better for copper based alloys. We also have ferrous based uh, uh, SMS that is uh, shape memory alloys which have very high tensile strength and huge super elasticity. So, in today's uh, application you see almost either of this group of uh, alloys competing uh, for the market. And, um, uh, one of the most recent application of this uh, shape memory alloys is uh, in the field of MEMS uh, <coughs> micro electro mechanical systems which is uh, used for uh, device applications. It is one of the emerging field uh, and it is called MEMS technology um, lot of um, <coughs> groups are actually co um, uh, converging into this area chemists, physicists physicists and uh, uh, mechanical engineers are particularly interested in MEMS technology because you can actually transcend from micron based devices into nano based devices uh, especially in constructing new MEMS uh, <coughs> device structures. One of the thing that is very important in a shape memory alloy uh, is the uh, transition that takes place. 
uh, in nickel titanium alloys uh, they are more uh, expensive um, but then uh, they have a very good uh, uh, transformation uh, to show this uh, shape memory behavior uh, especially in the conversion of uh, martensite to uh, austenite or austenite to martensite transformation and this figure shows the uh, transformation ratio uh, eta in terms of uh, temperature. Uh, so, as you start heating from the martensite uh, which is stable at low temperature the material actually transforms and the transformation starts somewhere here which we call it the starting point of austenite and then at a particular temperature the, there is a complete conversion of this uh, austenite to um, uh, from martensite to ar, uh, austenite and once you are here you can actually cool this to the martensite by uh, periodic cooling and you can see here um, the martensite uh, starts appearing again at temperature somewhere here and then again the conversion is completely through uh, when you go to MF that is a final uh, state of martensite. So, in this uh, transformation from martensite to austenite uh, and austenite to martensite you essentially evolve with the uh, hysteresis and uh, this is the hysteresis which makes this a useful shape memory alloy which means at low temperature you stabilize the martensite phase at high temperature you stabilize the austenite phase and uh, this is a plastic deformation that occurs in this alloy. So, mm, uh, this is uh, very important and uh, um, these alloys can also go through this martensite to austenite transformation not necessarily in with respect to temperature but also with respect to stress that is pressure. So, you can also apply just pressure without temperature uh, uh, at a particular isothermal condition you can bring about this uh, phase transformation ok. <coughs> so, uh, nitinol wire uh, in terms of application is used in robotics because of the shape memory property um, you can actually design robotic uh, instruments using nitinol wire that is why it is very costly because uh, uh, you can actually use it for uh, many functional applications. Uh, for example, the hobbyist robot uh, Stiquito uh, is particularly made of uh, uh, nitinol wire and in few magic tricks and particularly those involving heat and shape shifting. So, it is a, a it, it for, for a layman it appears like the, it is a magic but actually the property that is used is a shape memory alloy therefore, it is used in toys and in robotics, uh, but this is not as cheap as that this finds a very sophisticated application. For example, Japanese airlines Nippon uh, developed uh, this uh, uh, shape memory alloy that actually reduces uh, aircraft's engine noise therefore, in several application in today's uh, airline uh, uh, you know fabrication. Um, nitinol is quite uh, widely used. Uh, another example is the prevalence of dental braces which we use um, uh, to restructure our <coughs> uh, uh, teeth um, using uh, shape memory technology because uh, it will exert a constant tooth moving forces on the teeth um, and therefore, it always keeps the uh, shape intact and therefore, this can be used as a dental braces and also this has been used for several other uh, dental applications. <coughs> now, there are two uh, ways this uh, shape memory alloys can be used. Uh, they exhibit two sort of properties number one uh, it is a one way shape memory effect I can call it uh, I can abbreviate this as SME one way sh shape memory uh, effect or it can be a two way shape memory effect. What does it mean? Uh, suppose this is the initial state and then I try to uh, uh, cool it uh, on cooling I want to bend this uh, stuff. So, it retains this shape 
and I can play around with that, but once I do not want this shape I can actually heat it back and then I recover back the original shape which is nothing but your A. So, this is one way effect which means uh, whenever I go back then at low temperature it will recognize this shape and it will form to this particular shape. So, it is one way, uh, but at high temperature it again comes back to uh, its original shape, but whenever I cool it at to low temperature then it recognizes this shape that it was initially uh, 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 taken to. So, it will bend when it goes to that particular temperature. 2 SME is uh, something different uh, you start with this uh, structure and then in cold condition probably you have twisted it like this and in hot condition you have actually twisted it like this. So, it will actually display both this property whenever you are in the cold uh, um, temperature regime then it will recognize this shape when you come back to high temperature regime it will recognize this shape. So, it is called a 2 SME um, space uh, shape memory. Uh, uh, so, uh, both these effects are seen in a variety of compounds uh, some show only one way some show two way uh, shape memory effect. Uh, so, we have a, a list of alloys which uh, have been used. Uh, in the initial days of discovery actually uh, in the previous century um, it was actually uh, silver and gold based ones which have shown such uh, a shape memory effect, but what we see now is predominantly <coughs> the titanium nickel based one which is uh, nitinol and uh, the copper based ones and the iron based compounds. So, these have taken more limelight in the uh, in the recent past because of its extraordinary um, uh, stress strain uh, characteristics and also um, the way you can maneuver or you can make different uh, uh, value added products out of this alloys. Um, I will show some of the uh, examples in this uh, talk. Now let us take for example, nitinol as a case study and see why nitinol can be used and if nitinol is a shape memory alloy then what are the characteristics of this. So, physical properties of nitinol uh, it has a density of 6.5 grams per cc melting point is very high therefore, you can actually use this in variety of applications including aircraft because the melting temperature is quite high and it does not change much uh, over a wide spectrum of application. Uh, whether it is high temperature or low temperature the resistivity is of the order of uh, micro ohms and it does not change much. Therefore, that serves as advantage that you can use this for applications uh, for joule heating for example, I will show some examples how this super uh, shape memory alloys can be used uh, to regain its shape in uh, using temperature. So, for joule heating if you have resistivity along the same region at different temperature uh, regimes then it becomes very advantageous and heat capacity is of uh, 0.077 cals per gram uh, and then magnetic susceptibility although it is low, but they are quite comparable again at high temperature and low temperature they show magnetic property of the order of micro EMU per gram. <coughs> Uh, mechanical properties are also equally important when we are considering applications. Therefore, some of the values that we can have in mind um, typical yield strength is uh, uh, 550 uh, mega Pascal and uh, 100 mega Pascal at low temperature. Then tensile strength ranges from 754 to 960 mega Pascal, because when you are trying to use uh, uh, sh uh, 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 pressure to induce shape then you need to know what is the tensile strength that it can take. Uh, otherwise uh, if you exceed the strength uh, tensile strength then it will break it will get totally deformed. Therefore, you should know under what uh, tensile strength this shape memory alloy effect can be used um, and similarly you have the elastic modulus at low temperature and high temperature which is uh, uh, 75 and uh, 28 giga Pascal at. So, uh, 
this is uh, uh, quite a good amount of uh, details uh, which can uh, help us devise nitinol for several uh, device applications. Uh, the most uh, important um, property of the shape memory alloy is biocompatibility if we want to think about um, biological applications. One of the usefulness is uh, uh <coughs> the biocompatibility and strength properties of uh, nitinol uh, is to use this in switches um, and also uh, as a stent material. Nowadays we have switchers, uh, switcher materials which are both uh, bio dissolvable. So, you do not go back to the physician and try to cut open your switches after your, uh, um, uh, your uh, wound is healed, you try to take this uh, switcher out. Uh, you do not do that because nowadays you have a um, bio uh, dissolvable, it just dissolves over a period of time. So, you do not have the pain of going and removing your uh, switcher uh, uh, through a physician, <coughs> but uh, uh, nitinol is now used um, more so in uh, as a stent material. Stent is nothing but a, uh, a coiled wire like this, uh, you can see the shape of uh, this wire and this is predominantly used in your uh, cardiovascular applications. Also this sort of stents can be used in the neck region if there is a clot, uh, in brain if there is a clot then you can try to put a stent and then relieve the uh, blood clot. Uh, you can also put this in uh, kidney, uh, suppose there is a stone formation then you can actually dilate that place by putting a stent then the tract can be uh, <coughs> uh, released. So, uh, there are variety of applications for using stent not just for uh, uh, coronary artery applications, but I will try to show you just one compound which has a good compromise on biocompatibility, mechanical strength, chemical properties, how this can be used um, for a very invasive procedure that is happening uh, routinely in today's life. <coughs> this is uh, a cartoon that shows uh, before and after how this uh, nitinol based tent is employed. This is the uh, one of the artery of our human heart and uh, uh, these, this is a coronary artery where this uh, a yellow region what you see is nothing but your uh, cholesterol deposit which we call it as plaque and this plaque can actually hinder the lumen flow as a result you get into myocardial infarction which is uh, your uh, heart attack in other words. So, if you go through this uh, uh, <coughs> uh, anginal problem the best solution is to put a stent material inside to relieve this uh, strain and also to keep this uh, plaque away so that the blood flow can be restored. So, this is the situation uh, when you just uh, uh, insert the stent and you can actually deploy the stent and try to restrain this by blowing it with a balloon and that is what you see here. Uh, it is now stationed in the place where the uh, blockages and once you station this uh, stent then the normal recovery of blood flow is established as a result a patient recovers from a general problem. Now, the, the material that is placed here is nothing but a, a nitinol um, a stent, uh, it can also be replaced by several other stents, I will show you some example of that. What uh, makes this nitinol more special? Uh, apart from the shape memory effect and the super elasticity, there are other uh, uh, features which makes nitinol more versatile and they have amazing features. Uh, one is the stress hysteresis, uh, which is considered to be rarest uh, of uh, the nitinol alloys. What it means is, uh, although uh, stress is elevated in a linear fashion, uh, whenever pressure is applied uh, for most of the materials that is the way uh, stress increases with uh, uh, pressure. But what happens in nitinol is something different, it actually exhibits a property called loading plateau, meaning a very small elevation of stress despite large application of uh, pressure is achieved. So, 
even when you are pumping lot of pressure the stress loading is very very gradual in other words it does not go uh, linearly it rather tapers down there is a loading plateau as a result uh, suppose you insert your uh, netinol stent into the uh, cardiovascular stuff it does not really blow the coronary artery because it, it has a loading plateau. So, this is called a stress hysteresis which is a very important feature of uh, netinol and the second important feature is uh, the elastic hysteresis. Um, elastic hysteresis is nothing but the tendency of the opening uh, force to stay low despite the significant deflections of the stent. So, when you are trying to open the stent there um, the, the opening force is actually very very slow. Uh, you know if it is very sensitive and just deploys on its own then you cannot even station your stent at the right position because it would have got deployed somewhere else other than the place where you want. So, uh, this is called elastic hysteresis which is very useful and makes it more selective for housing a stent at the right position. So, uh, another useful thing is the full compressibility uh, that is shown by nitinol uh, meaning it has the ability to revert back to its original shape when external pressure which deforms it is released. So, uh, this can also be a useful uh, feature uh, full compressibility is possible. Uh, like um, in some uh, some of the shape memory alloys when you try to bring bring it back to the original shape it will actually collapse only 90 percent or 80 percent. So, in such cases the usefulness of that material is lost because you do not regain the shape fully, but full kind of compressibility is possible with nitinol uh, meaning uh, by mistake a physician has uh, uh, deployed the stent uh, for some purpose and he wants to collapse it back it should actually go back 100 percent otherwise that stent becomes useless. So, nitinol has full compressibility factor uh, it is uh, <coughs> yeah so it is observed that stent can recover once the pressure is released and it is also ferromagnetic with a reduced susceptibility to magnetic force. See suppose um, the stent is deployed in the heart the person will be very sensitive uh, to magnetic field. So, if it is too sensitive then that also can really bring about damage to uh, the stented uh, cardiovascular uh, system. Therefore, it has to be ferromagnetic, but with the reduced susceptibility which can uh, which can help the patient from getting exposed to severe magnetic fields. So, these are some of the uh, main characteristics of the nitinol which makes it uh, special. So, in essence uh, shape memory alloys are uh, uh, super elastic in its application, but uh, added to that comes two advantages one is stress hysteresis and elastic hysteresis and uh, this uh, along with the full compressibility factor makes nitinol one of the best ones. So, uh, just to uh, sum up. Uh, why nitinol is uh, good. Uh, if you look at the stress strain characteristics you plot stress versus strain and uh, in different uh, uh, regime this is how it works. Uh, in the high temperature uh, state you can see that uh, uh, if you take it beyond the transformation temperature it does not come back it is irreversible. Otherwise within the transition phases you see a clear hysteresis that is produced at high temperature and similarly at low temperature you can see another hysteresis uh, proceeding here. So, um, this is the way the stress strain curve uh, applies uh, uh, for nitinol uh, in the high temperature and low temperature regime plus you also have the transition which is very clearly seen uh, transition from the martensite to austenite phase is clearly seen in this uh, in this regime and this is also reversible which is highly selective. So, uh, the, you can clearly make out the difference between the uh, austenite to martensite transformation which uh, which gives you the allowance to play uh, uh, with the different applications uh, depending on whether it is needed in high temperature phase or in low temperature. <coughs> um, now, we need to understand how this deformation works and uh, this is another useful article 
that came out in 2007 in advanced materials uh, published by Mehta and co-workers. When you try to deploy this tens uh, in cardiovascular uh, devices you need to see how the deformation and fracture uh, occurs in uh, uh, nitinol stents um, and this can be done using in situ synchrotron x-ray micro diffraction that clearly tells you the sort of transformation that happens when pressure is uh, employed. So, this is uh, one uh, study which is uh, useful to understand how the uh, transformation occurs inside the heart when you are applying pressure and this view graph gives the mapping. For example, before deployment uh, when the stent is actually placed uh, this is the uh, mapping which shows uh, <coughs> how the um, tensile strength is. The red color um, indicates the tensile strength whereas, the blue color in this uh, contour uh, explains the compressive strain. And if you see here uh, this uh, the maximum local strain uh, in austenite can uh, vary between minus 1.5 percent to plus 1.5 percent. So, before deployment you can see the uh, compressive strain and the tensile uh, strain which is mapped in this extreme and you also have a neutral axis here. Now, if you start deploying this tent you can see how the uh, transformation occurs at 1 millimeter um, you do not see much of uh, changes, but when you go to 2 millimeters and then 3 millimeters and 5 and 6 millimeter you can clearly see the change between the compressive strain and the tensile strain. And uh, especially when you are deploying this tent beyond 3 millimeter and go all the way up to 6 millimeter you can see there is a complete transformation of your austenite to martensite. Okay. So, um, we can clearly map what sort of uh, phase transformation is occurring when you are applying pressure inside uh, your cardiovascular uh, uh, system. So, this is a um, useful way to understand uh, how much of loading this uh, stent can take and uh, how much uh, centimeter that you can deploy the strength and uh, what is the risk factor involved. Beyond a particular condition it cannot be uh, uh, brought back uh, to its original uh, state. In other words it loses its super elasticity therefore, this contour gives you a, a idea about um, the transfer transformation limit that is happening. <coughs> and that is what is uh, mentioned here uh, however, it is observed even at 6 millimeter deformation there is a region of strain stabilized retained austenite along the center of the stud that resists transformation. Consequently, the martensite transformation front moves down along the st uh, strut edge as deformation strain increases. This is what uh, <coughs> we see here. Uh, nitinol is not the only player, mm, there are several other ones. Uh, especially in stent applications we have many uh, alloys which uh, find uh, usefulness uh, in uh, in cardiovascular um, uh, biomedical applications. Uh, for example, uh, platinum chromium is one alloy which is now being used. Uh, now, the first question that might arise to us is why nitinol is replaced. Uh, nitinol is replaced uh, because it is of great demand because of its application in uh, aerospace it is highly expensive. So, one can go for alternate ones with better features. Now, if you look at the market um, uh, of stent technology in 2003 nitinol was very popular, but now you would see uh, there are other alloys which are performing uh, doing the same performance and they are costing much much less. Uh, one is platinum chromium alloy and the other one is uh, stainless steel alloy uh, and uh, the other one is uh, cobalt chromium alloy. All these are being presently used in uh, human heart. Therefore, it is good to take a look at what these compositions are and how they vary from each other. Now, uh, we should also understand that uh, merely getting a cheaper alloy is not important. We need to know whether it can really satisfy all the conditions that are needed 
when you dip, uh, put that in the uh, uh, coronary artery. So, when you take a platinum chromium when you say platinum chromium uh, stent then you are talking about platinum 33 uh, percent chromium 18 percent, but still you have a larger proportion of iron in this uh, <coughs> stent. Okay. Similarly, uh, when you say stainless steel the greater pro proportion here is uh, uh, iron whereas, you still have chromium and nickel involved. So, it does not really go by the nomenclature, but principally the shape memory effect is actually coming from uh, the this alloy composition. Cobalt chromium is one of the most widely used now in uh, especially in India a uh, lot of application based on chrom uh, cobalt chromium and uh, here cobalt is maximum 52 percent and uh, chromium is uh, 20 percent and then you would also see a uh, lot of other uh, metals are being used and there is another driver strength which is uh, also from another company where they use uh, 34 percent and 20 percent and uh, more of nickel is used, but still this is also referred to as cobalt uh, chromium alloy. Apart from nitinol we have several other shape memory alloys which can also do the job. Um, now, when, when we think about stent for example, as a useful application uh, what why we are looking for different kind of um, alloys, why we need to uh, drag many issues into this uh, stent uh, technology. One is the de design pattern, these are very thin wires of the order of uh, 2, 3 millimeter uh, and they have to be deployed. Therefore, the stent uh, pattern becomes very important because stent pattern can also relieve the anginal problem to a greater extent or it can uh, complicate the matter once it is put inside the artery. Now, these are several patterns which have emerged from different companies you can see one, uh, one is like a zebra crossing this is one uh, such stuff and then you have several models these are all um, a real marvel of mechanical design. Uh, it is not just to uh, uh, construe these uh, models in a using a CAD CAM, but then to execute this is a mechanical uh, if, uh, proficiency. So, uh, it is not just the chemistry that is important in choosing the material, but it goes all the way into a technology where you need to transcend beyond this, but keeping in effect the properties of the material and try to design several stuff. One uh, issue that is very important is the strut thickness, strut thickness is nothing but the gauge, uh, usually when we talk about a wire we call about gauge, gauge is nothing but uh, the thickness. So, strut thickness means uh, thinner it is better, because if it is thicker what will happen it is uh, rubbing with the walls of your artery walls and uh, it is uh, constantly in contact with your uh, lumen flow therefore, thinner it is better otherwise if it is thicker it is going to create more damage to the walls of your artery. So, strut thickness is important and if you carefully look at it uh, look at platinum chromium look at uh, cobalt chromium and make a comparison with the stainless steel. You can clearly see that stainless steel ones are actually more thicker and therefore, it is not very uh, it is not easy to bring down the strut thickness because that is the property of this material. So, in case of platinum you can go down to um, 0 0.081 millimeters which means you can make a very thin uh, stent and those are also easily uh, deployable. So, um, they uh, the different sort of alloys have uh, the privilege of controlling the size. Uh, we will continue with uh, the other information. So, the strut thickness plays a very important role uh, in deciding which sort of uh, uh, alloy can be widely used. Uh, a reduction in strut thickness therefore, can improve the stent um, deliverability and uh, improved uh, procedural outcome and uh, decreased rate of subsequent restonosis. Um, we will come to this uh, in, in the next few slides and show how uh, these things can be controlled. So, when you think about a stent alloy 
there are uh, four things that we need to uh, have in mind. One is visibility, visibility is nothing but as the uh, cardiologist is trying to uh, deploy the stent in the particular uh, place of blockage, he needs to see it uh, visibly uh, so that he can easily position the stent in the right place. And uh, uh, this need not be done uh, with the die because usually during the angiogram you try to pump it with a die to see where the blockage is. But when you are actually employing the stent the patient may be running at risk if you are going to take so much time therefore you need to quickly place the stent uh, even without the help of a die you should be able to map whether you are in the right place. So, I will show this uh, uh, in one of the cartoons. So, visibility is important stuff as I told you thin struts can bring down side branch compromise because uh, when you actually are going to deploy this in a side branch you should know whether it is going to damage the other wall. So, uh, that will help us and also bring down the instant restenosis risk and increase the flexibility radial strength which which is indirectly dependent on the stent geometry and low recoil it should not once you position it and deploy it you should not recoil back which is disastrous. Therefore, all these are very important when you are choosing the uh, stent alloy and uh, um, these are all uh, some of the prime factors that you would look for uh, when you are applying. Here is uh, two groups of uh, stent uh, element stent which is actually a platinum based stent and uh, liberty stent is nothing but a stainless steel based stent. This is stainless steel and this is platinum based stent. Now, if you see here the element visibility is much much better in the uh, element stent because of the presence of platinum. Whereas, uh, the liberty stent is predominantly a stainless steel stent and you can see uh, for a physician he would rather go with a uh, uh, element stent mainly because without the dye he can easily map it. Uh, in other words these are the x-ray images uh, taken when the stent is deployed inside the heart. So, the visibility element visibility plays a very important role when you are looking at a proper alloy. Uh, so, whether uh, it is a 2 millimeter diameter or 4 millimeter diameter we see proportionally the visibility is much more pronounced in platinum alloys. Uh, this is another uh, real time image which was taken while uh, the stent is actually placed. Here in the coronary artery they have placed one element stent and one liberty stent. You can clearly see that the uh, liberty stent is not to be seen at all. It is not easy to map it whereas, uh, even without a die you can see the element stent is traceable you can easily see the position. But during contrast when you pump it with die you can see that the uh, flow is restored irrespective of which alloy was used. But for a physician to take the right decision while he is deploying the stent what he looks for is the visibility. Uh, so, when he takes a uh, uh, when he takes a random x-ray photograph he should be able to see the, that this is in the right place. So, <coughs> but uh, people have also used uh, many other uh, coatings on this uh, devices for example, gold coated devices have been tried, but it looks to be although gold is a safer uh, metal uh, biocompatible uh, it seems to be that the restonesis is appearing at a higher rate when it is gold coated. Uh, so, gold coating is actually not uh, uh, prevalent these days uh, especially on this st stent alloys. Uh, <coughs> here is another uh, example where you can uh, see the visibility factor and uh, not only visibility factor you can see uh, actually the um, stent is placed here and uh, you can see the visibility of the stent uh, very clearly here and uh, why it is important is uh, this is done in the branching area therefore, it has to be it is very sensitive that it should not actually rupture this um, uh, this junction. 
So, uh, the choice of your stent is very important in other words you have to use a thin strut instead of a thick strut otherwise it will uh, induce more loading um, at, at this uh, interface which may be detrimental for the patient. Also it is found that cobalt chromium alloy because although it has higher elastic properties uh, and it is associated with greater uh, recoil strength. Um, it is uh, because of its recoil property it is clinically a bit disadvantageous when you compare to platinum chromium strength. <coughs> Uh, here is another uh, uh, view graph a uh, real time uh, view graph of uh, as angioplasty where you can see uh, this is the region where there is a blockage in the heart and uh, how um, the uh, platinum alloy has been used to map even without contrast. This is with contrast after the stent is deployed. So, you can see a normal flow of blood, but you can see the obstruction very clearly it is a very severely um, uh, obstructed patient and uh, one can find out uh, that uh, even without the biomarkers you can easily map the deployment of the stent here. And uh, similarly a side branch is preserved in this case you can see the blockage is here and uh, very carefully th because this side branching is very very intricate. So, if you are going to employ you should not rupture this branch and you can uh, see using um, taxes uh, element which is nothing but your uh, platinum uh, chromium uh, alloy uh, using that you can do the side branch preservation. The ideal stent is uh, therefore typically considered to be highly deliverable with a thin strut, low profile flexible design and high radio radiopacity. Um, radio opacity is nothing but visibility because it should give the contrast um, when you uh, uh, when you put it under x-ray machine and high radial strength and a minimum recoil. Um, therefore, close collaboration is needed between the engineers and uh, cardiologists to uh, advance this technology. So, depending on the uh, demands of a cardiologist the uh, technologist should be able to uh, remap the alloy composition and give the best. Uh, so, in essence when you look at uh, a stent geometry um, the whole thing is about the material that you are choosing which alloy you are choosing and uh, you can clearly see uh, this tip for example, this tip design is a marvel which is a mechanical um, prudency. Uh, why this tip is used because it will restrain the recoil of the um, of the stent and that is actually done using lot of simulations. Uh, when you go for short segments for improved conformability and minimal gaps on a bend you need a design like this because when you are trying to flip it you should not see that the strut to strut con contact is made. So, because you are actually mapping it through uh, several regions therefore, when bending occurs you should make sure that there is no contact between and only this sort of a helical um, uh, you know contour uh, will help you. And uh, uh, we also see this uh, two connector design uh, here which is engineered for maximum flexibility and conformance uh, to the vessel. So, um, the design of the stent and the choice of the alloy goes hand in hand therefore, uh, the property of your uh, shape memory alloy is very essential. The next uh, example that I want to touch upon is uh, shape memory polymers. Uh, from the engineering aspect tailoring the material properties of polymers is much more easier than alloys uh, mainly because of the cost. Uh, both it is the processing cost as well as the cost of the material uh, polymers are much more advantageous because you can go for wide range of application and it is traditionally much lower. Therefore, uh, shape memory polymers which is also abbreviated as um, SMP uh, shape memory polymers are uh, of equal demand. Uh, shape memory polymers can uh, can be uh, restored with a external stimuli like light and uh, either you can use UV or infrared light to reverse it back or you can use chemical effects uh, solvent or pH change to revert it back or add a heat um, 
and uh, these are uh, very easy and accessible for us to bring about the shape memory. Uh, the first person who actually used uh, shape uh, or who found this uh, shape memory effect in polymer is uh, Professor Hayashi and uh, <coughs> he used polyurethane as the material to find this shape memory effect and uh, later uh, jet propulsion lab in USA they brought out many such applications using this polyurethane especially making open cell foams and uh, space mission foams biomedical applications all this they try to evaluate um, using this uh, polyurethane. So, when you think about uh, uh, polymers with shape memory effect predominantly they are polyurethane based ok. One or two examples that I will give uh, suppose you have a polyurethane fiber and you twist it like a ring uh, or like a spiral ring like this. Now, you can straighten it out. Uh, so, this is a straightened polymer either uh, because of application of temperature or you pulled it. Now, you can actually insert this same tube in a syringe and then you can put it inside a jellyfish ok and then you can actually. Uh, so, you can see the morphology of this wire it is a straightened one, but you can actually recover it back from the jellyfish. Once you recover it back it again goes back to its original. Why we are uh, uh, doing this on jellyfish because you can uh, try to simulate such applications in when we try to uh, deal with our cell tissues. So, uh, this polymers can become very useful in biomedical applications. And what is the mechanism? Um, uh, unlike uh, the case of uh, alloys, where in high temperature they may be hard, in uh, low temperature it may be soft. Uh, in case of uh, uh, thermo res responsive polymers, you have both the transition segment and elastic segment available both in the cold phase as well as in the high temperature phase. So, this is exactly a opposite phenomena of shape memory alloys because in austenite it may be hard in martensite it may be softer in case of uh, shape memory alloys, but in this case both the phases are present either in the cold phase or in the uh, hot phase. As a result you can see uh, this is uh, this is the uh, morphology with which you start and then you can when you heat it you can stretch this polymer along. And, uh, immediately when you cool it can actually retain this memory and once you heat it again it can revert back to its original shape. So, it, it, it has both the features in it. Uh, you can retain the memory when it is hot and you leave it there or you can heat it again and revert it back. So, this is one application. Also the shape memory alloys you can try to pattern it uh, using laser because in this way when you try to pattern it you can try to fill this shape memory alloys with anything that you want to cap it with. So, it is very useful um, in cell culture and uh, in several other applications these polymers can be easily patterned it is not possible uh, with shape memory alloys. So, polymers can be used for making devices. Uh, this is another application of a shape memory alloy uh, this is nothing but a polyurethane alloy with the black composite um, using uh, carbon black. And what we are doing now is uh, putting some amount of nickel here and this nickel you can actually apply parallelly some magnetic field and you can alloy this nickel into straight chains like this. And a close look at it you can see nickel actually forms a chain. Why? Because once it forms a chain like this then when you are heating this polymer this can provide a electrical pathway thereby you can heat this. So, this whole composite becomes very very uh, conducting when you try to impregnate this with the nickel and you can try to make this sort of linear chains of nickel inside the polymer. So, uh, this shape I will give an example of this uh, in a hybrid situation how this sort of alignment can help. Uh, here again there is another example of a shape memory effect where uh, you actually do indentation in other words you try to apply very high stress and in this uh, region you can see a dent is formed. This is before indentation that means you are applying very high pressure. So, it has made a mark, but once you heat it, it recovers the shape. So, this is the 
uh, depth of your uh, of your indentation you can actually go minus 60 nanometer you can just plunge it with a with a pressure and then once you heat it back it again comes back to the same shape. So, the shape memory polymer incidentally can bring back the shape that you are looking for uh, this is one other application and here again you can see this is a shape memory polymer this is before you start uh, putting it in hot water if you immerse this in hot water you can see slowly it changes it bends and then uh, once you try to take it out it again retains back to the same shape. So, this also has a shape memory effect upon immersing in hot water. Um, this is another uh, demonstration of how a hybrid uh, polymer can be used. Um, this is a hybrid uh, polymer shape memory hybrid polymer which is used and now we can start heating this uh, polymer and you can see here as you heat the cycle slowly there is bending and it is actually touching a elastic beam. This is elastic beam this is a shape memory hybrid. Now from here it almost comes in full contact with the elastic beam here at 80 degree C and on cooling again you can see that it reverts back to its original position. So, this sort of uh, things can be used for several applications. Um, because you can reverse and bend uh, the shape uh, by changing the temperature. Here again you can see the, the way the cyclic loading occurs when you use a shape memory hybrid you can try to bend it any way and you can try to again re retain back the same uh, shape. This is a rubber like uh, stuff. This is another good example where you are having a um, shape memory alloy and you have a shape memory hybrid material which is nothing but your white stuff which is a polymer and inside the polymer you are actually having a shape memory alloy. Now, what you are doing is just intentionally you break this hybrid material in B1 you are breaking it and it is now cracked here and inside is your uh, shape memory alloy. So, what you start doing you connect uh, this to um, some piece and start applying some current you can actually fuse the shape memory alloy because we, that is also elongated. Now, after you heat it you can see it has restored back to its original position. What has happened the shape memory hybrid also has got fused along with the healing uh, self healing has happened to the shape memory alloy uh, not only that the sample is also healed. After this you can see that you can still bend it. Uh, it has recovered back to its shape. So, this is a hybrid uh, device of both shape memory alloy and a shape memory hybrid together performing several useful applications. So, uh, in essence uh, I have shown you uh, some examples of uh, alloy uh, composites um, or uh, polymer composites uh, in combination or separately they find very useful applications. Um, there are several applications which I have not covered uh, especially in the aircraft aerospace uh, industry. Um, in the next few lectures I will give you some of the bibliography where uh, you can actually go and do further reading to enhance our understanding on this shape memory alloys. Uh, 